from the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors these broadcasts. It's an honor for us to have as our guest for this edition of Conservative Roundtable, Dr. Herb Schlossberg, who name, whose name became known to me, uh, oh, perhaps 20 years ago, when my spiritual mentor, Dr. R.J. Rushdooney, said that a book that Dr. Schlossberg had written was one of the most important books of the 20th century. And that book was called Idols for Destruction. And uh, I know many people were uh, tremendously influenced by that book. Would you just uh, tell our audience how you came to write the book and what the message of the book is? Well, Howard, I know that uh, you, like I, are familiar with what America was like in the 1970s. Um, Even earlier. Yeah, but uh, I'm trying to think of what of that word that Jimmy Carter used uh, on television one time. Malaise. Malaise, right. It was, uh, uh, our, our country was gripped by malaise, he said. And uh, he took, us, took some heat from that, but it wasn't entirely off the wall. Uh, we had just come off a losing war in Vietnam, uh, a war that many of our own people were saying was unjust. Uh, we had gone through a cultural revolution uh, in which people were saying that uh, what used to be right is now wrong and vice versa. Uh, we were going through a period of uh, economic frustration. We even had to invent a new word to describe what we were doing, and that was stagflation. It used to be thought that uh, inflation was a product of economic growth, and you couldn't have stagnation and inflation at the same time. And so all of this was going on, and morale was really quite low. And um, I was trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, uh, we, I had just resigned from an academic position. My family had moved to Minneapolis, where we had lived before and where we had friends. And uh, I had time to try to figure things out. Uh, I, had, I had a degree from the University of Minnesota, so I had library privileges, and I just uh, uh, went there every week and took out 10 or 12 books and read them and took notes, uh, trying to find out what was going on, just for my own sake, because of curiosity. And uh, one day I said to my wife, you know, I think there may be a book here in all these notes I'm piling up. And she urged me to take a year off while she supported the family and try to turn that into a book. Well, it turned out to be a four or five year project, uh, but that's how that book came into being. I was trying to understand for my own uh, sake what was going on, and it was a book. And what was the thesis of the book? Well, uh, all of us were aware that there were a lot of pathologies going on the task was to understand what brought them about, what connection there was between the moral um, uh, problems, the economic problems, the political problems, the uh, crime rate, family divorces, and all of that. I, I thought there had to be some connection between them. And uh, I finally come out with the idea that uh, and the organizing principle that made most sense to me was idolatry. And uh, as you know, this being a disciple of Rush Dooney, this uh, was um, a concept that was introduced in the Old Testament. The idea behind it was that the people of Israel were supposed to worship the one true God, uh, but they kept straying to worship false gods. And those false gods were generally made of stone or wood or ceramics or something like that. But the idea is expandable from there. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, some material object that we worship. Anything that is ultimate to us, to which we give our obeisance, any principle, any idea, any person, any entity, uh, any institution that we make ultimate, uh, is a, 
an example of the biblical idea of idolatry. And uh, it seemed to me that if I could identify the various aspects of idolatry, that would provide a unifying principle uh, to help us understand what the problems were in our society. Now, this was published by Thomas Nelson Publishers? Originally it was uh, uh, for the first six years. Then it was picked up by Regnery Gateway uh, and then Crossway. And they have had it in print for the last 15 years or so. How many copies have been sold? I have no idea. They don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want you to know. <laughs> well, uh, under Nelson, uh, Nelson published 10,000. Uh -huh. uh, That's not bad. No, no, it's not. Uh, people find it a hard book, so it really isn't bad. Regnery published, uh, printed 2,000, and let it go out of print after just a year. And uh, uh, Lane Dennis at Crossway is a friend of mine, but I've never asked him how many he's printed. It had an extraordinary impact. I know so many people who've written about it, discussed it, and... Uh, I'm sure it's one of the books that will be remembered. It's, in my, it's on my list of books that people ought to read. You've had a remarkable background. Uh, you were a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division. You've been a professor of history, an intelligence officer in the CIA, a college dean, a businessman. You're now a fellow with the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C. You earned your Ph.D. from the University of Minnesota on the topic of European intellectual history, and your most recent book, uh, which I've been glancing through, I, I have to confess I've only read the first couple of chapters, uh, is called The Silent Revolution and the Making of Victorian England. And uh, one thing that struck me reading the early pages of the book was the transformation of cultures as the result of the uh, advocacy of certain ideas by certain highly visible people, the impact that Voltaire had on France, the impact that the Fabians had uh, in England. Uh, I, in the 1960s and 70s, was in the belly of the beast uh, of the Great Society. I, I headed the U.S. Office of Economic Opportunity for a period of time, and I saw all of the perverse cultural transformations that were that had their genesis uh, in Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. The legitimation of abortion, of sodomy, the idea of quotas, uh, the, uh, the idea of a man as an entirely material being to be judged by class and race and ethnicity and physical characteristics rather than spirit and soul. And, uh, and it truly did change American culture. It led to pornography. It led to so many other things. And uh, the question is whether uh, God will bless us with a kind of Christian revival that will let us get away from these terrible influences. Are you optimistic that th this could happen? Well, one of my favorite writers was Chesterton, and he talked about those two great fools, the optimist and the pessimist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the uh, the Christian virtue that we want the, to the replace difference those... The between the optimist and the pessimist is the pessimist has more information. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, what they say. I don't buy that. Yeah, they, no, I don't think so. Uh, well, you know, both of them operate the same way. They, they look in the past and they see a trend. Uh, the man who likes the trend is an optimist. The man who doesn't like it is the pessimist. But they're basically looking to the past. And uh, Chesterton said the, the, the Christian virtue is neither optimism nor pessimism, but hope. Uh, hope, not just a, a vague wish, but rather uh, confidence that God is going to bring it out the right way. That's the uh, biblical definition of hope, and I think that makes a lot of sense. I noticed uh, the name of Howard Amundsen as one of the sponsors of your work. I knew him slightly. At one point, he was a big supporter of Dr. Rush duty. How did you come to know Howard Amundsen and his wife, Roberta? Uh, the same way uh, I came to know you, in effect, or vice versa. He, they, liked the, uh, they liked Idols for Destruction, and they got in touch with me, and we began doing things together. 
Well, he's so they, they made this book possible, and the, and the one that I'm hoping will come out after that. Now, we're going to have to go into a break. When we come back, I want to go into some detail on this very important book, The Silent Revolution and the Making of Victorian England. And you've got a perspective on the Victorian era, uh, which uh, may be surprising to people who've accepted a conventional view quite different from the fact you presented. Please stay with us. We'll be back. Uh, with Dr. Herbert Schlossberg right after these messages. There are many conservative organizations, but the Conservative Caucus is unique in that our standard for evaluating public policy is the Constitution of the United States. Our goal is to advocate policies which conform to what the Constitution stipulates and to oppose those which undermine the Constitution. It's clear that the federal government has only those powers which are provided in the Constitution, which were initially delegated by the states to the federal government, or which were subsequently added by amendment. If we adhered to that principle, your taxes would be lower and your liberties would be more secure. The Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org or 703-938-9626. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks a lot for all you guys have done. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Find curious facts from America's past at loc.gov, the Library of Congress website. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, and our guest is Dr. Herb Schlossberg, the author of Idols for Destruction, and uh, the author of another book which is well worth reading called The Silent Revolution and the Making of Victorian England. Now, uh, you smash many preconceptions in your book. Tell us about the book and, and how you came to write it. Well, we've been talking about uh, Idols for Destruction, and uh, that really was the reason that I, I started working on this book. Uh, some of the friendly comments I had on that first book were that it was too negative, too dark, and uh, there, was, um, there was a need to show the way out, show us how to get out of this mess we're in. And uh, I thought that was a great idea. The only trouble was I didn't have the slightest idea of how we were going to get out of it. Uh, but as I kept that thought over the next few years, um, it occurred to me that I really did know a way out of it, or at least knew how to find a way out of it, because I was convinced that it would be uh, easy to demonstrate, although I wasn't able to do it at the time, that uh, the Christian gospel had a transforming effect on society. I thought it would be possible to show at various points in history that this or that society had been changed by the impact of the gospel, and since I was trained as a historian, I thought I ought to be able to find one of those places. Now, almost everybody with even a superficial knowledge of history knows that in the English-speaking countries, the 18th century, generally speaking, was more or less secular, and the 19th century was more or less religious. So if those generalizations were true, it ought to be possible to find the changeover point and describe what happened. And uh, I chose that period to study to try to find that changeover point. 
and the changeover point was the pre-Victorian period uh, when the gospel really began to make an impact in the late 18th century. It changed the, so <clears throat> it changed the society so that when Victoria came to the throne in, in 1837, it was a different society. It had become the classic Victorian society that everybody loves or hates. And uh, in our society, uh, educated uh, thought is that it was a terrible kind of society. It was full of repression and poverty and uh, hypocrisy. Can't is a favorite description for it. And uh, my conclusion is that all of that is basically wrong. Uh, it was not a perfect society. It did have those bad aspects. But the society was changed so that um, the Hellfire Club we were talking about before, characteristic 18th century godlessness, uh, disappeared. Uh, the church blossomed. The moral structure of society changed. Uh, people became what they called respectable. Uh, but I think what we would call moral instead of immoral. Uh, and it was a completely different society. If I could uh, show you the cover of this book. I was just going to ask you about that picture. Yeah. This is uh, William Holman Hunt's uh, uh, picture um, called The Awakening Conscience. It's a very interesting picture. The actual painting is very beautiful. <coughs> this monochrome reproduction is not, but I think we can see what it shows. This man is shown here with his mistress uh, sitting at the piano and uh, her conscience has just at that very instant been awakened which is where the uh, title of the, uh, of the picture comes from. She has a, a look of horror on her face as she suddenly realizes what, a, what a, an evil life she has begun to live her paramour doesn't realize she has gone through this. He is behind her, and he has a look of, of pleasure on his face, and he is about to be acquainted uh, with the transformation that this young woman has just undergone. There are lots of little details uh, on here which uh, illustrate it further. There's a, on the piano, there's a hymn book. Uh, down here, it's hard to see in this picture, there's a fluttering bird trying to get free that symbolizes her life. She is trying to get free uh, of, this, uh, of this life she has fallen into. And I asked the publisher uh, to put that on the cover because I thought that symbolized uh, what had happened to England, uh, living this dark, sordid life. And uh, I want to say suddenly, historically it was sudden, over a period of 30 or 40 years, it had become something approximating what, a godly society. What were the Christian influences? Well, um, uh, it goes back quite a ways. Um, uh, England had started going down the tube seriously in, in 1660 with the restoration of the monarchy. King Charles II came over from France with the French court, uh, lived a grossly immoral life at court. Uh, they kicked the Puritans out of the church and then... Thirty years later, they kicked the high churchmen out of the Church of England. So what was left? The mushy middle. And uh, things stayed bad until uh, the late 1730s when the Wesley brothers were converted. And as a result of that, the Methodist movement started. And they would go around the country preaching in little mining villages or fishing villages uh, or manufacturing villages. Uh, Converts would be made, Methodist classes would be started, as they called it, which were little groups uh, for prayer and Bible study. Um, and uh, gradually this spread to the parishes of the Church of England. And from the parishes of the Church of England, it spread further to dissenting groups like the Baptists and the Congregationalists, which should also uh, turn godless, as the Church of England had. And so you gradually get a thickening uh, uh, Christian uh, influence throughout the kingdom. And then uh, at the end of the century, uh, you get some really outsized people like William Wilberforce, uh, uh, who, crusader against slavery, 
And the evangelicals of that period uh, were very different from the ones that came on later on. They didn't see any contradiction between the reform of society and being faithful to the gospel of Christ. And so you'd get the one-two punch of changed lives internally, but also in the whole of society. And that was the real making of Victorian England. Now, of course, England is not on the right track today. There's a, an evident decline of religious faith. You have the Archbishop of Canterbury saying some really outrageous things. Yes. Um, what happened? When did it turn bad again and why? Well, you don't realize this, Howard, but you have just introduced my <laughs> next book, <laughs> which uh, is finished, and I, I have a, um, a publisher now who's interested in publishing it. It won't be out for another couple of years. Uh, the subject of this book is um, the crisis of uh, Christianity in late Victorian England. Uh, and it answers the very question you just asked without realizing I was going to answer it this way. Uh, it's, um, it will be a 500-page book, and so I can't go very far in, uh, in answering it in the minute or two that we have. Uh, but I will say this. Um, the basic problem was not Darwinism, as a lot of people thought. The basic problem was not German theology invading England, as a lot of people thought. The basic problem was the internal weaknesses of the churches that were unable to face the challenges that were theirs in the late 19th century. Well, that is a book that will be well worth reading, as uh, is this one. And um, just to ask a technical question, how much time do you spend every day writing? Well, uh, I spend... Uh, uh, six or eight hours a day reading, and then uh, when I start drafting, I, I do the research first and then draft. Everybody says that's the wrong way to do it, but that's the way I find works for me. I still spend uh, those six, eight hours a day working on putting it all together. We have to take a break. When we come back, uh, we're going to uh, let you know how you can be in contact with Dr. Schlossberg at, at the uh, Ethics and Public Policy Center, uh, with which he is now associated in the D.C. area. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. There are many conservative organizations, but the Conservative Caucus is unique in that our standard for evaluating public policy is the Constitution of the United States. Our goal is to advocate policies which conform to what the Constitution stipulates and to oppose those which undermine the Constitution. It's clear that the federal government has only those powers which are provided in the Constitution, which were initially delegated by the states to the federal government or which were subsequently added by amendment. If we adhered to that principle, your taxes would be lower and your liberties would be more secure. The Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org or 703-938-9626. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors these broadcasts. If you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss, <coughs> excuse me, on Conservative Roundtable, please check out our website, www.conservativeusa.org. We'd be delighted, and with no cost or obligation, to send you some materials. Uh, you can fax us your name and address. Our fax number is 703-281-4108, or you can drop us a note, TCC, the Conservative Caucus, at 450 Maple Avenue East, Vienna, Virginia, 22180. Dr. Schlossberg, how can people make contact with you? Uh, is it with the Ethics and Public Policy Center? Yes. Uh, we're in uh, downtown Washington, D.C., um, I don't have the 
telephone number. I right think it's going to be on the screen. Okay, and uh, www.epbc.org. How did you hook up with the Ethics and Public Policy Center? Uh, I knew them. I respected them. They liked my work, so we hooked up. Very good. And uh, what burdens, if any, do they place on you? They want me to do the best work I can. Publish or perish? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I'm, gonna pu I'm publishing, and that's good enough for them. And um, I know you're saving this for your next book, but give us a hint about uh, in the post-Victorian era, era uh, England has increasingly gone astray. And we have, we have seen, in, uh, although Queen Elizabeth does a very good job of uh, preserving her dignity and decorum and so forth, other members of the family have not been as rigorous. That's right. What's happened? What's gone wrong? Well, I wouldn't do much about the royal family. The royal family has always had uh, uh, serious moral problems. The big exception of that was the life of Queen Victoria. Uh, but her own son uh, had these problems and uh, continued them after he became King Edward VII. Uh, but uh, it spread throughout society, even during the Victorian period. Uh, I started in the 1860s, and things were starting to go bad even then. But they were still able to produce some extraordinary public figures. Yes, they were. Winston Churchill was one of the most remarkable men in all recorded history. Yes, and, uh, half American. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny Jerome right. was his mom, and uh, his morality was of a higher level than that of either his father or his mother. Uh, right, each that of is true. Each of whom represented... Uh, significant decadence. Yeah. Well, I applaud your work. I look forward to reading the rest of this book and going back and seeing Idols for Destruction. Congratulations on it now having been in print for 25 years and a very happy birthday and success in all Good. you do. Thanks very much, Harry. Good to be you. here with you. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us on Conservative Roundtable.